stay on price and what we heard from Michael Saylor, because yep. he's gone ultra maxi bullish on Bitcoin. He, of course, is the executive chairman and co-founder of MicroStrategy, which was the first publicly listed company to put Bitcoin on its balance sheet as a reserve asset. Uh, and he is saying that Bitcoin's value could surge to $13 million per coin by 2045. And that's an upgrade from his forecast in June for $10 million per Bitcoin by 2045. What do you make of that? I don't think it was that bullish. I think it might not be bullish enough. Uh, wow. So uh, if, if, we, if we break that down, um, I, don't, I, I didn't prepare the talking points. So I don't have the exact amounts in front of me right now. Uh, however, if we break it down, he sort of charted out sort of the bear case, the mid case, and the bull case. So he gave sort of three price predictions. And basically what he did is he said, hey, look, Bitcoin has averaged a 150% compounded annual growth rate. We don't believe that's going to continue moving forward. So what will it continue moving forward? And that's how he got sort of the three cases. Uh, basically, the bear case is that it moves up faster than the S&P 500. I think it, it moves up at twice the rate. Now, is that reasonable to think that it could move at twice the rate of the S&P 500? Well, pretty much any of the big tech companies do. So, I mean, that's one case. We also know that, as I mentioned earlier about houses and the S&P 500 moving up at the rate of global liquidity. So, we know that the, the S&P 500 basically moves up exactly like the, like the global liquidity. However, gold has a sensitivity ratio of 1.49. So, that means gold moves up for every 10% rise in liquidity, gold goes up by 14%. Bitcoin has a 8.95 sensitivity, which means for every 10% rise in liquidity, that Bitcoin goes up by 90%. So for every 10% raise in liquidity, S&P 500 goes up by 10%. But Bitcoin goes up by 90%. So his bear case was that it would just double their performance of the S&P 500, which is, I think is way too extremely bearish, in my opinion. Um, so that's it's it's... And that ties into your whole crash up theory, right? That, uh, yeah. So yeah. So then we just we just predict. I mean, we can look at the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO projects what they think the debt levels and the deficit levels will be by 2050. Sailor, I said, I think said 20. 2045, which is 21 years for, for the 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, but we can just see what the CBO projects for the debt levels and the deficit levels to be by 2050. And if Bitcoin continues to move at a sensitivity ratio, uh, you know, at least of two times the S&P 500, right now it's at nine, um, then we will easily surpass Michael Saylor's numbers. Um, I think it moves even faster than that. But I don't think when you break down the math, it's not that crazy. Now, if you wanted to use that same number, how much are the median U.S. homes in 2045? Right. How much is a yeah. gallon of gas in 2045? And a lot of people are going to be very shocked if they do that math. And that's back to your point when you look at the denominator being the dollar, and that's the real issue, that the dollar's purchasing power is eroding as it gets debased and devalued. Mark, your forecast for 2045, much more bullish than Michael Saylor's. Let's bring it a little bit more into the near term. Is there a price forecast you feel comfortable giving for, say, the end of 2024 and mid 2025? Yeah, I think uh, 2024, the end of this cycle, I think it should be somewhere in the 100 to 150,000 range based off of where we're at. However, if if Trump were to win and enact those policies, I think we get to the upper range of that, which could be 400,000. So we'll know that obviously by November, um, things could drastically change. If the Harris administration wins, then we might undershoot that target. So I think all eyes are going to be what happens with this election. If uh, Harris comes in, it, it could be, again, underwhelming that number. It could be extremely bearish. And if Trump wins or FK wins, it would be extremely bullish. So I think somewhere in that 100,000 to 400,000 range, as I, I know that's a big number. Uh, but I think we'll have to wait and see what happens with the election. Longer term, though, I think, you know, I talk about often that, you know, uh, it's very unclear in the short term. It's much clearer when you think about the long term. So I would say that, you know, uh, I think I think a million dollar Bitcoin by 2030 is in play. Um, that's two more cycles. Basically, we'll finish this cycle plus one more four year cycle. I think that number is in play specifically when you look at what's expected to happen with global liquidity and the sensitivity ratio that Bitcoin moves on that um, global liquidity. Right. And look, you say a lot can happen in this election cycle. We've had guests on the show that aren't even so sure there's going to be. An election this year. Well, that that's another conversation, Michelle, and that's a very scary conversation to have. And unfortunately, um, never in my life have I thought that way. But unfortunately, that's something to obviously consider at this point.
Right. Uh, as I say, anything is on the bingo card for 2024. And we've certainly seen an unprecedented election cycle already with an attempted assassination attempt, uh, weaponizing of the Justice Department, swapping out candidates. Uh, so we still have a lot of volatility and uncertainty. As we wrap up here, I will keep it on a political note because you mentioned both parties want to pander here to the Bitcoin crowd. Now, many people, I don't know that many people have Bitcoin as their top voting decision-making position, uh, even though there's a lot of money in the Bitcoin space. But I want to go back to your point where you said that this election, um, it's not Bitcoin that's on the ballot. It's a vote for freedom. So as we wrap up here, if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I, you know, I think the part of the reason why there's such a big divide in this country, and I, and I hate to use big platitudes and stereotypes, but we have one group of people who just want to live and let live. Let me do me. Let me focus on my family and my business. Let me do me and you do you. You want to be whatever you want to be like, cool, good luck. But there's another side that wants to tell us what to do. And so we'll never agree. Like, there's no way those two sides can agree. Like, you want to have purple hair and whatever, like, cool for you. And like, I'm going to do this, like, cool for me. And like, go do you, I do me. And like, we can still be friends. But when you want to force your ideology on me, we, we just we, will never reconcile that. And so that kind of goes back to what's on the ballot, right? If Trump maybe doesn't understand Bitcoin, but he's for freedom, which is you should be free to save your money in whatever you want. You want to save your money in Beanie Babies or Pet Rocks? Cool. Go for it. I might think that's stupid and I have the right to say it's stupid, but I shouldn't make it illegal for you to do that. That's Trump's position. But unfortunately, the other side of the aisle is saying, no, 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 no. You do not have the right to own any assets. You do not have the right to store your wealth in a way that, that you want. Uh, we will tell you we are the arbiter of truth. And that's what's really at the back. Forget Bitcoin for a second and just think about really what they're saying. Do we or don't we have the right to save our own wealth, our own private property in whatever we choose? That's, that's what's at the ballot. And hopefully, uh, my hope is that people can sort of put the political ideology behind and also the Bitcoin issue and just look at the greater, bigger thing, right? Do we have the right to store our wealth? Now, unfortunately, Michelle, back to being a debt-based monetary system, we aren't really allowed to own anything in a debt-based monetary system. So the money in the bank legally is not your money. That money is owed to you. Your stocks that you think you own, your Apple, Google, Tesla, you don't actually own those legally. Your broker owes them to you. Your house that you've paid off, you don't really own that. You have to pay monthly to the county assessor or they take that from you. And so Bitcoin is sort of that last thing that we can own. And I think that's part of why it's the attack vector. But it really comes down to um, freedom of choice. You may think Bitcoin is the stupidest thing in the world, and that's perfectly fine. But why would you make it illegal for me to want to own it? <music>